amazed when a gifted musician, I need more, need more, a gifted musician will get up and come to the instrument and then he nods to a bunch of other musicians <laughs> and they play like they've been together for 75 years. I mean, God must be glorified for that kind of... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's always been so much debate over the years in the church about music, and it's always, it's always made me smile. All you got to do is read Genesis 1, and you know that God is a God of variety. And while folk are always trying to stick God in some cultural pigeonhole, just amazes me. Same God that made the roses, made the dandelions. Be very careful about deciding what God likes and does not like. Just get to heaven and find out. We have a couple that have been very much a blessing to us here in the short time they've been here. And they're leaving. I just want to mention them. Um, Wendy and Stiles Simmons. Please stand. She's been our stewardship director. Stiles has gotten a job back up in Michigan, so they're leaving us. Today's his last Sabbath. What I like about Stiles here, he came here unbaptized and is leaving us wet all over. We baptized that brother. <laughs> we wish the Simmons family our love. God bless you. God bless you. My subject, Egypt and worship. Egypt and worship. Two weeks from now, the Sabbath and worship, part one. And then the week after that, the Sabbath and worship, part two. Let's pray. We're looking for the message you have for us, Lord. We are ready to receive it. As Denise has sung, we now have our empty cups raised. Fill them up. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's, let's review it one more time. We have, we, have done, we have done the spring feasts. Passover which is the biblical representation in the feasts of deliverance from sin, right? Followed by the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which represents the growth in Christ we must experience after being delivered into the wilderness. We keep stressing that, Shira, we're delivered into the wilderness you come into the church and you go into the wilderness and while there you're nourished by the bread, the manna, the unleavened bread, which represents your walk and growth in Christ, right? We've already talked about that. And then comes Pentecost, the feast that represents the fruit that God expects to harvest. He didn't save you just to save you. He saved you because he wanted you to bear fruit. And that fruit, that Pentecostal experience, the receiving of the Holy Spirit, is that third feast or that third step in your growth in Christ. Well, before we get into the fall feasts, and I'll do that in September, the Feast of Trumpets and Atonement and Tabernacles. 
We said we would spend some sermons deviating from these spring feasts and stress the fact that all these feasts were acts of worship. What are they? Worship. You cannot study the feasts without pausing, Honey Sue, and say, now, what really are they? Well, Will Allen, they are acts of worship. They came to church and they worshiped in these feasts. Two weeks from now, we'll see how these feasts, these festivals were different from the Sabbath and what the Sabbath did that the feast did not do. So these feasts are acts of worship, folks coming to church and worshiping. And we, and we pointed out in my first sermon on this aspect of worship, and we'll review it in just a moment, we pointed out that, that when God first called them out of Egypt, he said he wanted them to come out to worship, didn't he? Let's read the text again. Exodus 4. Exodus 4. And uh, verses 22 and 23. Just a quick re-highlight of that. Then you shall say, God speaking to Moses, to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel's my first, my, my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go that he may, what's the next word? The Hebrew word is the word for worship. Worship me, but if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. So I find it interesting, and don't want you to miss it, that the prime, the prime reason, now I, think about this. They've been slaves for 430 years. They've been abused and mistreated and, 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 and looked down upon. And yet God's stress for freeing them isn't for freedom. You would think he would say, I, I, I've called you that I might set you free. No, 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 no. I've called you to serve. And it says something about, uh, Joey, the, uh, the nature, the, the importance, the, uh, the essence, the uh, kerygma, the kernel, the, 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 the very core as to why God has called us out of Egypt. It's that we might worship, serve. Totally different than you might think. So in the first of these three sermons, well, it's going to be five now, these sermons on, 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 on God's, on God's uh, attempt to get the Israelites sensitive to what it means to worship and to approach God in his holiness, we stress four things. I'm ready for those on the screen. We stressed four, we learned four things, four things. First, first, genuine encounters with the holy God can have changing effect on a person. In other words, when you sit in church on Sabbath, some, something ought to happen. You, you should not just worship and just go home the same as you came in. Something, something innocuous about that. That's not real because we've studied, we studied, we're ready for, we're ready for number two. We've studied that, we, we, we saw several incidences where folk came before God and Carlson, they left changed. Then we learn number two, read, God's holy presence, everybody, can be a blessing to those who worship properly or a consuming fire to those who don't. In other words, sitting in church on Sabbath, listening to a sermon, somebody is saved and somebody's lost. Same sermon. What do they say? The same sun that melts wax uh, hardens the clay. Thank you, sis. Appreciate that very much. Yes. So, 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 so don't take for, don't take for granted. And we're going to get into that next, in my next sermon. Don't take for granted that coming in here means a blessing unless you have come to worship. We're going to deal with a problem today. See, the problem with you worshiping is Egypt. Then number three, we learned in that first sermon on this issue of worship and the feast, we learned we learned. Ready? Read. 
when you do not know the Lord. Remember, we read the text. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord uh, that I should obey him? Then he said, I know not the Lord. That was a mouthful. When you know the lesson, when you know the Lord, you are compelled by that knowledge to worship him. And so I had to say, I was not comfortable saying it, Rob, but I had to say, I had to say that, 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 that some people who have difficulty being truly reverent in church are announcing they don't know the Lord. You recall that a consciousness of God often drove people to their knees instantly. Have you read those passages? They would fall flat on their face. Why? I'm in the presence of God. We're not seeing that. We're not seeing that kind of submissive humility in church. We almost walk in with a pride and an arrogance to be seen of men and women. And then the fourth thing we learned, dealing with these lessons from that, from that first sermon, here we are, we have to, come on, we have to prepare to come before the Lord, physically, mentally, morally, spiritually, even to the things we wear. That got us upset. That got us upset. Remember that, Keith? Yeah, someone didn't shake my hand. No, no, walk by me. Yeah, I was fine, because I had preached the truth of God. I was okay, just fine. My heart was full of joy because I know that the Bible has told me that sometimes the word is like a sword. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so we're going to build on that today. Sermon number two, worship in Egypt. Now, here's the key sentence. Every one of us who comes to worship the Lord for any reason must deal with the deliverance of the present being at war with the Egypt of our past. See, when you walk here this morning, your real problem with worshiping today is what you did this week. Let me say that again. It's hard to suddenly become worshipful, submissive, humble, and contrite on Saturday morning when you've been the devil all week. Did, did you get it the second go around? Very difficult to pull that off. See, the subject is Egypt and worship. And, and I think, Levison, what we're, what, we're, what we're wrestling with is that we are being Egypt right up to sunset Friday. I think some mark may be going beyond sunset Friday. And then the sun rises on Sabbath morning and we want to put on holy looks and holy clothes and holy expressions and holy words and, and holy walk and, 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 and holy, holy. But the fact is, when you've been in Egypt all week, Egypt creeps through on Sabbath. So I'm breaking it down so you can get it. Now, let me show you. See, let me show you this. This, this thing is biblical. Pastor didn't make this up. This is biblical preaching. So I'm going to take you now through several texts to emphasize this. Now, our scripture reading set it up. We won't go back there. Go now to Exodus 16 and verse 3. Now, you recall in the scripture reading, Don, here comes, here, they're free. Here comes Pharaoh. Here comes Egypt. And, and, and they have no confidence, Richard John, in God. And so here they say, would to God. Were there no graves in Egypt? 
Now, I find it interesting, Jermaine. You're free. You have been a slave for 430 years. You haven't breathed a breath of fresh air your whole life. And the minute you run into trouble, you want to go back to slavery. I'm trying to get that thing in my head. But it says something about the power of Egypt. The person is saved in church and brought away from their liquor, but as soon as pressure comes, they go back to the bottle, Egypt. Are you listening to me? So we have to study this thing. This is a serious problem. Exodus 16 and verse 3. Ready? Read. And the said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. My, my, my. Read on. When we sat by the pots of meat, Kentucky fried, and when we are ate bread to the full. For, oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I pastor got, his eyes got crossed reading this text. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. For, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now, I, I'm going to show you something, Reed. I'm going to show you something. That, that, that here's the thing about see, Egypt. Egypt affects you a lot of ways. It's uh, Egypt, uh, what you wear, what you eat, how you do your music. It's all Egypt. And here they are again, Richard, under pressure. And it's, we, oh, we, 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 we want, oh. And look at the things they remembered. Is anybody listening to the pastor? It's a serious sermon today. So here they are again, faced with crisis. And of course, it's in Exodus 16 that they're going to be introduced to manna. Manna. Manna don't fly, don't squawk, don't walk, don't swim. <laughs> manna comes down from heaven. Lord. We remember those good old dinners down in Egypt. Do you see it? I'm just reading the Bible, y'all. Exodus 17, 3 and 4. My Lord. Look at here. 3 and 4. Come on. And the people, everybody's reading, and the people thirsted. My verse is a bit different from yours. I'm in the New King James, but read on. Thirsted for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, why is it? You have brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst. Verse 4, so Moses cried out to the Lord saying, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. Christians don't seem to have any backbone when it comes to living in the wilderness. I keep telling you, you were delivered into the wilderness. I've told you that all through this year. We don't seem, and every time trouble comes, we yearn for where we came from rather than think about where we're going to. Past, past is a powerful modem hard to switch it off. And this is why life in the wilderness must be preceded by daily prayer, shouldn't it? Because you know you've been on your knees sometime praying and Egypt rises up. Can I get a witness? Yeah. Yeah. This is a serious sermon. Uh, look at Exodus 32, 23. Exodus 32. And verse 23. Mm, mm, mm. For they said to me, make us gods that we shall go before us. As for this Moses, this man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Now, now, they, now they want to reach back to the gods of Egypt. Are you listening to me? Let's say it again before I move to another book of the Bible. Let, let me say it again. Let me say it again. Your problem today, listen to me right now. Keeping your mind on this sermon. 
receiving what God has prepared for you, the, you're battling right now with the Egypt in you. It is your constant problem every time you walk in this church. That's your language. That's your attitude. Not be Egyptian. Let me stick in my new word. Not be worldly. I want to define that word in a minute. Not be worldly. That's your challenge. Cutting loose. Cutting loose, Ron. And listen, folk. And truly, Scott, giving the Lord 100% of yourself at least for an hour not worrying about the bills not worrying about the kids not worrying about the marriage not worrying about the job not worrying about the house and the mortgage just worship the Lord tell Egypt to get out of my way I'm in God's house not bringing that stuff in here this is my oasis my place of peace, my refuge. CPC, I made it through the highway, got around the beltway. I'm here now. Leave Egypt out there in the street. It's hard to do. Hard to do. Numbers 11, 4 through 6. These people were a frustration to their Savior. Numbers 11. Four through six. And the mixed multitude, that's a group you want to watch out for. Now watch me, you, you chuck them. See? Mixed multitude, half Egypt, half Israel. Huh? There's a sermon. Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. Yielded to what? <laughs> so the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us meat to eat? Pastor kind of slipping in two sermons at the same time, didn't he? You see how he's doing that? I'm just reading the Bible. Y'all got awful quiet. We remember the fish. which we ate, no, the Bible is really a, a, a humorous book. There they are, out in the wilderness. Man are coming down from heaven. Where is the beef? <laughs> At least give me some tuna. <laughs> verse five, verse five, folk. We remember the fish, which we ate free in Egypt, the cucumbers, that's good stuff, the melons, yes, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. You know, you know, you know it's a funny thing. You know, when, when, when you are being negative, come on, y'all. When, when, some folk, when they complain, nothing's right. Because they ain't got no meat. Now we just dried up. We just dried up. Now you're smiling, and I'm doing this purposely because I'm setting you up for a very, very serious truth. You see, that is the problem when you walk into this church on Sabbath morning. The devil makes sure that something, I'll talk about in the next sermon, something happens on Sabbath morning, how many of you know I'm telling the truth, to take your joy. And you walk in here, dried up, song can't help you, Prayer can't help you. Sermon can't help you. You done already been messed up in your head before you get to church. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Egypt's a bear. Numbers 11, 18 through 20. Same chapter. Then you will say to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat. <laughs> for you have wept in the hearing of the Lord, saying, who will give us meat to eat? For it is well with us in Egypt. See, Egypt, Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. <laughs> Verse 19. Don't mess with Jesus, y'all. Don't mess with Jesus. You shall eat, not one day. 
nor two days, nor five days, nor 10 days, nor 20 days, but for a whole month, I'm gonna Kentucky fry you until your nostrils become loathsome to you because you have despised the Lord who was among him saying, why did we ever come up out of Egypt? See, the issue is not to me. God says the problem is, you, I brought you out of the world. I brought you out. You left the clubs, you left the dancing, you left the, I brought you out. What's it doing in here? You brought it in here with your head. Your head is messed up with Egypt. Now I'm tired. I'm going to give you all these if you want. Numbers 14, 2 through 5. Jay, wait on you. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses. Do you see the pattern here? Is anybody following these texts? And the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt. Now, let me just say something here. Folks who can't get over Egypt will die in Egypt. If, or if only we had died in the wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? Can you imagine how God felt? In this passage, they're on the borders of Canaan. No, no, no. This is, this is Numbers. You remember what happened in Numbers 14? Numbers 13, they sent the spies. And because they didn't believe the report, God said, okay, nobody's going in. They're on the borders, and they're still, listen, we're on the borders. These are the last days. We're almost home, and we're still crying out for Egypt. You know why we get into, you know why we get into debates in the church about things like music? I'll tell you why. Our hearts are double-minded. And we have lost the natural discernment of what's right and what's wrong. And so we live in a constant state of confusion, and we want somebody else, the pastor, the elder, to tell us what's right, what's wrong. Because we don't have a deep enough relationship with God to know for ourselves that stinks. That's the problem. So here they are, wishing. Well, here's the problem. Numbers 20, 2 through 6. Well, I'm going to skip over that. I've done that enough. Go to Numbers 20 and verse 15. Numbers 20, 15, because this really nails it. See, this is, this now, I, I, you, you, if, you, if you didn't circle the rest of the text, circle this text. Because this kind of sums up. This is the problem, actually. And it kind of sneaks in on you. Moses is talking. How our fathers went down to Egypt. And we dwelt in Egypt. What's the next phrase? See, I get up in the morning, I'm in Egypt. I go to work, I'm in Egypt. I was born in Egypt. It's called this sinful world. I've been in Egypt all my life. And I have failed maybe to understand as a growing Christian, Wendy, that the whole purpose of God calling me into the church is to detach me from Egypt. But now Egypt's in my house in the computer. Egypt's in my house on the TV. 
Egypt's in my house on the TV games. Are you listening to me? I am permeated, saturated, surrounded by, engulfed by, embraced by Egypt so much. Next sentence is key, is key. So much, I don't even discern anymore how much Egypt there is in me. And so then when the pastor or the elders or somebody gets up and denounces certain, thing, certain things in, in, in a sermon or in church, I get offended because I can no longer discern what's Egypt from what is not. And I have decided that what I'm doing is okay. Not by any standard here, but because I'm inoculated with Egypt. I've got a sentence in my notes in big red. Longevity in Egypt desensitizes us to Egypt's dangers. Please, therefore, understand the issue for today. God wanted to bring his people out of Egypt so they could worship him. Simple, huh? Well, if you're simply talking about moving bodies from one place to another, you're great. God, it's simple. Get them out of Egypt. Just turn some water to blood and send some frogs some flies and some fleas and assail the captives with boils and locusts and fiery hail and darkness and then with an act of omnipotence, slay all the firstborn. And oh yes, not only were the people set free, the Egyptians all but kicked them out. God's difficulty never was getting the Israelites out of Egypt. It was getting Egypt out of the Israelites. And so in response to the problem, Damon, he gets them out there. And in Exodus 25, verse 8, he says, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now, I've just given you the first step to getting, out of, to getting Egypt out of you. See, Egypt and Jesus can't occupy the same place at the same time. My son, give me thine heart that I may not sin against thee. We got a list of things. We don't want to hear the pastor talk. Don't talk about this. We don't hear that. We don't hear that. And then, then we'll make up our own theology that that's not religion. That, that's not salvation. But whose Bible are you reading? God is much more in the cleaning, cleaning us up business than we realize. There's lots of things about you you've gotten comfortable with that drive God crazy. And that's why he keeps driving you pushing you, working on you, digging at you. You're content. He's not. God wants to put you, Dr. Wendy, what's, what's the deepest kind of scan they can do on the body? Pet scan. God wants to pet scan your soul. Thank you, Dr. Wendy. Pet scan your soul. And what I like about him, he, he's a better doctor sometimes than the doctors. Because the doctor will do the PET scan and he'll make a list of all the things wrong. You go home just so bent over and figure, well, I'm going to die tomorrow anyhow. I'm also. <laughs> but God, God, let's talk about God for a minute. Let's talk about God's mercy and grace. God finds all that stuff and he just works on you step by step, only as you're able. Give God a hand. <laughs> Gentle, loving, kind. Patient, because if he told you all the problems, you just wouldn't get out of bed the next morning. Go on and burn me in hell right now. I'll never make it in. But God has more faith in you than you have in yourself. I can fix this, he says, but you've got to admit that it's there. Egypt is there. Stop getting offended and bracing every time somebody mentions something you don't want to hear about. Open your ears. Maybe your clothes aren't modest. Don't get all jacked out of place. 
rather than arguing with the pastor, you ought to ask yourself, do I know what modest is? And if I have an Egyptian mentality, you probably don't. Because the clothes you're wearing were made by Egyptians. <laughs> Did you hear what I just said? And so when I come to church, I must ask myself, what, what, what am I doing? What, what am I doing? What am I doing? Egypt was hard to shake. For 400 years, the Israelites had been exposed to idolatry and Egyptian lifestyle, which was quite secular. What word did I use? Say it again. They had been exposed to Egyptian entertainments, Egyptian food, which was often mind-numbing and physically debilitating. They were exposed to Egyptian immorality and, in some cases, irreverent language and the hopes. And, you know, you know and, and my heart goes out to some of you. Some, some of you folk work in places where the Egyptians curse and swear all around you, don't they? And do you find when you get in the car, you have to, you have to put some music on to... Because you can't let that stuff slip out at CPC. That's why, that's why you think you're so grown. That's why you need to watch some of them movies. Bip to the bam, 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 bip to the bam, 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 bam. For a two hour bit of bam, bam, and you turn it off. Oh, yeah, okay. Let me see. Let's have evening worship now. <laughs> and one of these days, when you least expect it, somebody insults you in church, and Egypt crawls right across your tongue. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? See, we dibble, we dibble and dabble in Egypt. We think that we can turn Egypt off and on at our will. You ever studied the history of the Hebrews? You ever recognize the fact that with all they had been through with God, now watch, watch this, brother, all they've been through with God, and, and, and yet their whole history, way down to Babylon, they never got over the one most innocuous Egyptian influence they ever had, idolatry. They couldn't shake it. That's how powerful Egypt is. God and disgust them in Judges 10 now. Judges 10. And you should learn about the clock because I'm going to fish this sermon until I'm done with it. So I'm going to get all that out and I'll shut up. Not until. And, and Judges 10. Now, let show you how, 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 how we are with God and how sometimes God just whew, uh, judges 10, verse 10, and the children of Israel cried out. You know, that's in the Bible so much now. They're always crying out to the Lord. Yeah. It's like some of us, oh, Lord, have mercy, saying, we've, we, we've sinned against you because we have forsaken our God and served the Baals. Verse 11, so the Lord said to the children of Israel, did I not deliver you from the Egyptians, from the Amorites, from the people of Ammon, and from the Philistines, also the Sidonians and the Malachites and Maonites oppressed you, and you cried out to me, and I delivered you from their land. Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will deliver you no more. Go and cry out to the gods which you have chosen. Your God is money? God says, go to the banker. Just stop praying. Stop wasting your time. Just go to the banker. Your God is your wardrobe? Go to your closet. Your God is that relationship? Then go there. 
but don't keep coming to me crying out, thinking you're going to worship me, and at the same time, hold on to what you want. Now, Kobe, I got to get there now. See, I got to get there now. I got to go on and get there. See, that's, see, see so, 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 Phil, here we are. Here we are. See, God's getting to here. So I might as well say it. God is saying, how can you sit in church and hold on to that thing that's destroying you and worship me at the same time? Just forget about worship and go on and hold on to the thing that's destroying you. That's a tough text. And yet, you know, God is something else. God is something else. If you keep on reading this passage, it sounds rough. Keep on reading this passage. Verse 16, so they put away their foreign gods from among them and serve the Lord because his soul could no longer endure the misery of Israel. You act in that, and you act in that, and you keep on holding on, and then you cry to the Lord, and the Lord says, if you ought to read in the Hebrew. Hebrew says, I can't stand you hurting like that. I'll save you again. I don't know why you're sitting there. I'm, I'm, I'm giving God glory. I'm giving God glory. If you're just giving some of yourself, if you just start where you are, God is not enjoying your struggle because your struggle is just that, your struggle, which you produced and created by your choices. If you just open up your heart for five minutes, God says, I can't stand to see you in that struggle. Therefore, I will save you one more time. Hallelujah. Let's go to my final text. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. I'm going to give you now the New Testament version of the Egypt problem. <laughs> this is how the New Testament puts it. 1 John 2. Old Testament says, get out of Egypt. Stay out and stop crying about not being there. Here's what the New Testament says. 1 John 2. 2 and verse 15, New Testament version. Do not love the world. <laughs> Isn't that straight? Yeah, do not love the world or the things in the world. And when I was, now, I, I, most of you know your pastor's an old, I'm an old-fashioned Seventh-day Adventist. Old-timer. The old ways. Yes, yes. And so when I was coming up, we, had a, we, we called people worldly, worldly. That Glenn, yeah. We, we, we knew what worldly meant, worldly. Yeah, too much bopping in their step, certain kind of music, you know, and the way they dress, worldly, worldly. Places they went, worldly, worldly. The old folk would shake their head, worldly, worldly, worldly. Yeah. Well, we, see, we've lost it. We don't know what worldly is. We have no idea what worldly is. There's so much world in the church, we have no idea what worldly is. And that's why we get offended when certain things are brought up. Because our minds are worldly. Now, somebody would be upset with me because I said that. But I didn't say it, and I didn't say it. Our minds are worldly. Our minds are inoculated, anesthetized, compromised, immunized, and cauterized with worldliness. So we can't tell right from wrong what's good and what's not good. And somebody brings up a subject, we sit there, well, I don't think wrong with that. That's your problem. You don't see. You don't see. And it's reading and studying this that gives you eyesight. But you see, when you're worldly, watch me now, when you're worldly, Chris, then even when you read something in the book that steps on you, then we get, we get into philosophy. Well, you see now, see, that was, see, when, when, when Paul said, when Paul said, he was, he was writing to that day, and of course, in this day, why don't you just shut up and do what the Bible says? That's too simple. That's too simple. Yeah, we have to do some, yeah, too simple, too simple. So, so, love not the world, neither things in the world, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. 
and the world is passing away. Woo, Egypt is getting out of here. And the lust of it, but he who does, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Now, the word for world is cosmos. We get our world cosmos. It's used several times in the Bible, but in most cases it means of or relating to worldly things as distinguished from things of church and religion. Not sacred, not religious. So in the, in, in the New Testament, worldly are, are things that are anti-religion. Anti-religion. Now, let me, let me help you with something. A lot of folks like to go to the clubs, you know, go to the clubs, sit cool, drink, 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 you know, drink, drinks. We, we're not drinking alcohol. No, we, we do Adventists to drink alcohol. We drink, we drink other kind of stuff. We go ginger ale, you know, ginger ale. We're in the club, in the atmosphere, you know, grooving, grooving, you know, grooving, grooving. Watch me now. I'm going somewhere with this. Pastor's not playing. And then we think we're going to come into church on Sabbath and get a blessing from real religious music. And it doesn't cross our minds that that mix in our heads is spiritual dissonance. But we've become so used to Egypt. And you see, when the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, CJ, talks about the revival of, 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 of primitive godliness, it means we're going to get a little old-fashioned again. And what's going to happen is that people that are not there they're going to leave the church. There'll be a falling away first. And they'll say, we've become extremist. Yeah, extremist. See, this issue of diet, we get all stiff. Some of the pastor meets, he mentions meat, we get all stiff. But what you don't realize is, is that all that fat that you had on Friday night, that your stomach's trying to digest all night, and you come here on Sabbath morning, then you snore throughout the sermon because, no, no, don't laugh. Do not laugh. And you sit there and you can barely stay awake. Your body's trying to consume all that stuff that should not be there. And the Holy Spirit leaps right across your brain and you get nothing. This thing is serious. And we keep shrugging off stuff that we don't want to deal with. But it gets more serious than that. Because everybody that comes in this church on Sabbath is broken, corrupt, messed up. Got kinks in our souls and knots in our head suffering with DNA problems and dealing with habits of the past. We come in here messed up and this is the get fixed up place and the devil knows that. So he works all week to make sure when you come in here on Sabbath that what you need most never happens. And there's a church service where God makes a call and you ought to respond and you can't move. Paralyzed by Egypt. Boy, you know, the pastor really preached a good sermon. He said, well, you know, I was, was kind of sleepy, child. I just, just couldn't stay awake. Lord, help you. Lord, help you. like the person who just had a stroke and the emergency team shows up and you say come back later are you a secular person See, I want to set forth a growing concern 
The Israelites had been in Egypt so long, they didn't know how much Egypt was in them until they tried to put Egypt aside. They'd become worldly, secular. It didn't happen overnight. It happened over 400 years. God wanted to dwell among them to flush it out. True worship grows out of disdain for the world, for Egypt. See, notice the text says, love not the world. The word used there is the word agape. He's really saying, that's the same word used when you're told to love God. He's really saying, don't feel about the world the same way you feel about me. Agape, not the world. That's a strange word to use. Somewhere, listen, somewhere, Christ has got to rise to the forefront. And you've got to become more discerning. Then you don't need somebody in the pulpit to tell you that shouldn't be or that shouldn't be or you shouldn't go there because the Holy Spirit is telling you. You make up the decision all by yourself. You understand that's not good for you. You become that way even about relationships. Some of us keep making the same old confounded mistake over and over again with the same kind of person dressed up in different kind of clothes but having a different kind of line and we can't get it in our heads here comes hell again because we are wrapped up in Egypt and we keep looking for something that's not being offered by God So Jesus says in John 15, 19, I've chosen you out of the world. Titus 2, 12, you've got to live contrary to the world that you're in. Colossians 3, 2, reprioritize your affections. Matthew 16, 26, what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Let me put it to you in plain English. What are the choices you're making worth? Your soul. Ladies and gentlemen, you want to see the Holy Spirit run rampant in the pews of CPC? Let's get rid of Egypt on Monday and step on Egypt on Monday and kill Egypt in our house on Tuesday and get rid of some of that stuff we wear wearing to work, let alone to church, on Wednesday. By the time Friday comes, Egypt is so far from us. Come on, somebody! Egypt is so far from us. We walk on these holy grounds, and the Holy Ghost says, I can do some work in here. They've come with their brokenness. They've come with their need. They've come with their hearts open. I can do some work in here. And every Sabbath, somebody walks out of here fixed, straightened up, cleaned out. Why? Why? Egypt ain't in here. Praise God. In a world of many choices. Help us, Lord. Miss of all the many voices when they all call out to greet me I turn my eyes to thee cause I found in you a loving friend who stays with me till the very end yes I found in you a faithful guide 
who calls me his very own. I choose you again and again. I choose you again and again. You mean so much to me, dear Lord. I choose you again. I choose you again and again. I choose you again, over and over again. You mean so much to me, dear Lord. I choose you again. Just hold D. Two appeals. First is general, but it's important. As I worked on this sermon, the thing that hit me, Allison, first looking at myself, and you always, you always have to know that when Pastor Wright preaches, he's always preaching to himself, and I hope you get something out of it. And I said, Lord, you, you, you got you to gotta help me discern worldliness in my own psyche. And so I found myself during this week praying for discernment. So that I really can sense and see. So that, that's my first appeal. You want the Holy Spirit to sharpen your discernment. You, you're willing to sit there and say, you know, Pastor, even after you're in your sermon, I, I'm not sure whether what something I'm doing is worldly or not. I'm really not sure. And you know what? I have no intention of giving you a list. Because the Bible has no list. It just says, love not the world. I don't believe the Lord asks us to do anything he won't help us do. So I'm not going to give you a list. Well, this is worldly. That's not. I mean, that's childish. And you'd argue with me. But I don't think that's worldly. And quite frankly, the Bible doesn't care what you think. So, so the, the real issue here is, is having the Lord in your heart. And, and your love for him increase. Does that make sense? And then you and, you and the Lord work it out. Because I'm not going to. Let me say it again. Like I did after the other sermon when folk got so upset. You can walk in church next Sabbath. Every how you want to walk in church. I'm going to hug you. I'm glad to see you. I'm not your judge. Man, I'm trying to be saved, y'all. I'm trying to get in the kingdom. I ain't got time to be judging you. You walk in church, I'm going to hug you. Glad to see you. But ultimately, you and God got to work that thing out. See, because as long as what you're doing is based on what Pastor Wright says, you're not going to be saved. Preachers are sinners saved by grace. Well, I'm not doing so and so anymore. Why the pastor said, Pastor said, I ain't wrote, I, Pastor said, you better try that. Pray the pastor gets in the kingdom. Don't, don't quote me. Seek a relation with God that gives you the kind of discernment so, so you don't need a list. You just kind of say, You know, I don't, yeah, and, and I see the people, you know, Pastor, I was so and so, and I just I, I had a feeling, Lord have mercy, that's discernment. I had a feeling that wasn't right. So my first appeal, you want the Lord to increase your sense of discernment. Would you stand on your feet? Now my second appeal. You've been waiting to make your decision to come out and come in. This is a Egypt and church choice. Maybe you've taken Bible studies from Brother Smith or one of our elders and you've never really made that decision to join the church. Or maybe your person's been attending here for a while and you've never made the decision to put your membership here. Just want to transfer. Or you want to come forward to take Bible studies. You want to choose Jesus. That's what Denise is thinking about. I invite you to come. They'll let you come down the aisle. They'll let you get out of the uh, pew. You're downstairs, anywhere in the building, in the, in the uh, balcony. Just move and come down front. Now, Denise, we need to hear more. You're praying. Your heads are bowed. Somebody tries to move next to you. Let them out of the way. Let them come. Who'll come today? 
Please, where are you? I turn my where are you? To thee, I found in you a loving friend who stays with me till the very end. The walk is not that long. Just come on down this aisle. A faithful guide calls me his very own. I choose you again. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. so much to me. If you want to sit down, Pastor Smith. I choose you again. Somebody else, please. I choose you again. Please. I love begging for Jesus. No shame in that. Hold thee softly, Daryl. You're praying. I want to make sure we give all the opportunity. And of course, to my friends now watching me at home. CPCSDA.org. Let us know that you decided today to belong to Jesus. We'd like to hear from you. If you're in the church and you're watching us and you recognize that your discernment level is compromised by too much infusion of worldly stuff, then you stand in your, stand in your living room, stand where you are, if you can, and just take your pledge with this congregation, asking God to increase your sense of discernment. Some of us are in jobs where a lot of stuff goes on and it's, it's just, you, 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 you feel like your mind is constantly compromised. Some of us are going to schools where, man, trying to get that degree, but we're hearing a lot of stuff that just ain't biblical. And you want to make sure your discernment is sharp. You know when you're getting something that you don't, you, you don't want to keep. Somebody else going to come before I close? I want to take that walk? for soul sometimes gets to me. You're sure. You're downstairs. You're sure you're not going to come up. Balcony, you're not going to come down. Sanctuary, you're not going to come for You're not going to do it today. You're sure. Pray, church. Pray. Just pray. Just pray. Just pray. Thank you, Father, that your spirit is still working on me. Thank you, Lord, for gradually moving me from my Egyptian ways to the ways of Israel, the overcomers. That's what the name means, overcomers. In this world we live in, it's hard to pull away and come and worship. So help me during the week not to get so involved in Egypt. That's the problem. So that my Sunday through my Friday is the walk of the Israelite. Feeding on the manna, not complaining about what I did not have feeding on the manna and then I bring I bring to CPC with me on Sabbath I bring a heart open I don't have to work so hard on Friday to cast Egypt aside because Egypt no longer is in my life help us Lord and we thank you in Jesus name and the people said Amen.
Please be seated. Are you glad you came to church today? 